10 reasons why blacks should leave the Democratic Party. Reason number 10, choice in education. We will rescue kids from failing schools by helping their parents send them to a safe school of their choice. The proposal that I brought forth on education ends all private charter schools in this country. And tonight, tonight I say to the city of Chicago, sign a contract with the unions that does not expand charter schools in Chicago. And so the point is, if I'm president, Betsy DeVos's whole notion from charter schools to this are gone. But, but, but black and brown Democrats want choice. Do you know who doesn't? White Democrats. Poll results from Democrats for education reform. Among white Democratic voters, only 26% expressed a favorable opinion toward charters. Blacks, 58% favorable. Hispanics, 52% favorable. Again, these are among Democrats. <laughs> well, just how bad is school choice? Some charter schools have raised kids' test scores. High test scores made these charters so popular that parents line up, hoping to get their kids admitted. This line goes on and on. What's sad is that there is a line. A million kids are on waiting lists to get into charters in America. Number nine, the Democrats' refusal to even consider the privatization of Social Security, something that would disproportionately benefit blacks. Because African Americans generally have shorter life expectancies than do whites, they receive less total Social Security payments over the course of their lifetimes. Social Security also contributes to the growing wealth gap between blacks and whites. Because Social Security taxes squeeze out other forms of saving and investment, especially for low-income workers, many African Americans are unable to accumulate real wealth. And since Social Security benefits are not inheritable, that wealth inequity is compounded from generation to generation. African Americans would be among those with the most to gain from the privatization of Social Security, transforming the program into a system of individually owned, privately invested accounts." End of quote. Number eight, race-based preferences to achieve racial diversity. What this does is cause a mismatch between college and student. The student, you know, who supposedly benefited from racial preferences. This is UCLA law professor Richard Sander, who, by the way, is a Democrat. Nationally, the great bulk of uh, minority students, especially African-American students, were receiving very large preferences, typically on a scale of a couple hundred, the equivalent of a couple hundred SAT points or 10 LSAT points, 10 to 15 LSAT points. That uh, bar pass and traits were generally very poor for this group. Uh, only about a third of blacks starting law school in the early 2000s were graduating and passing the bar in their first attempt. Number seven, the welfare state. LBJ's war on poverty, the intent was honorable, the effect disastrous. The illegitimacy rate among blacks was about 12%. In 1918, the illegitimacy rate among black teenagers was less than that among white teenagers. So how do you explain the increase in illegitimacy and or wedlock marriages or slumliness in general. Well, I mean, I think any economist, economist would tell you that if you tax something, you're going to get less of it. And if you subsidize something, you're going to get more of it, whether it's wheat, cheese, or slovenly behavior. And indeed, in the United States, we have been subsidizing slovenly behavior. That is, we have been making the cost of illegitimacy or having kids out of wedlock relatively cheap. That is through welfare payments, through other kinds of in-kind uh, uh, payments. Number six, illegal immigration, something supported by big business for cheap labor, supported by Democrats for votes. 
George Borjas, the Harvard economist, has probably done more work on the effect of legal and illegal immigration than any other economist in the country. Because a disproportionate percentage of immigrants have few skills, it is low-skilled American workers, including many blacks and Hispanics, who have suffered most from this wage dip. The monetary loss is sizable. The typical high school dropout earns about 25K annually. According to census data, immigrants admitted in the past two decades lacking a high school diploma have increased the size of low-skilled workforce by roughly 25%. As a result, the earnings of this particularly vulnerable group drop by between $800 and $1,500 each year, end of quote. You see, Democrats realize that there are more votes in porous borders than there are in wanting to secure the borders. Because after all, they used to sound just like Donald Trump on immigration. Check out Obama, Clinton, Feinstein, and Harry Reid. Those who enter the country illegally and those who employ them disrespect the rule of law uh, and they are showing disregard for those who are following the law. All Americans, not only in the states most heavily affected, but in every place in this country are rightly disturbed by the large numbers of illegal aliens entering our country. The jobs they hold might otherwise be held by citizens or legal immigrants. The public service they use impose burdens on our taxpayers. I think we can enforce our borders. I think we should enforce our borders. If making it easy to be an illegal alien isn't enough, how about offering a reward for being an illegal immigrant? No, no sane country would do that, right? Number five, the Democrats' hostility towards the police. All these false accusations of institutional racism do one thing cause the cops to pull back, causing crime to go up. It's called the Ferguson effect. Well, the Ferguson effect is the twin phenomenon of officers backing off of proactive policing and the resulting increase in crime. Last year, we had the largest one-year increase in homicide in nearly a half century. The vast majority of the victims of that homicide increase have been black. The reason for this crime increase, I believe, is that officers are living today under a false and dangerous narrative that says that they are shot through with systemic racism, that we're living through an epidemic of racially biased police shootings, and that the type of proactive policing that I think is responsible for a 20-year crime decline that this nation has enjoyed uh, is under attack as racially oppressive. Number four, Democrats' job-killing policies. As my dad used to always say, I never got a job from a poor person. Let's just take one example, the ever-increasing minimum wage. Thus, the consequences of minimum wage rates have been almost wholly bad to increase unemployment and to increase poverty. Moreover, the effects have been concentrated on the groups that the do-gooders would most like to help. The people who have been hurt most by minimum wage laws are the blacks. I have often said that the most anti-Negro law on the books of this land is the minimum wage rate. If minimum wages can make people richer... The unions we're talking about Well, now. if unions can make people yeah. richer, well, all you have to do is tell people in Bangladesh, why don't you unionize and demand a higher wage? You can be rich like the United States. Number three, the Great Recession. The Great Recession was really an affirmative action recession. How so? Because of pressure put on banks, literally a gun to their head, they lowered lending standards to the point where virtually anybody who could fog up a mirror was able to buy a house. A disproportionately large number of people who never should have bought homes bought them, and when the inevitable recession came, they lost everything, including the money they put into their homes. Peter Wollaston is a Republican member of the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission set up by Congress to look into the origins of the Great Recession. Here's what he said. Without the government's housing policy, there would never have been a financial crisis. That's not exactly the same thing as saying that government housing policy caused the financial crisis. It's stating it another way, and that is, if we hadn't had the government's housing policy, that is, or but for the government's housing policy, there wouldn't have been a financial crisis. The subprime mortgage was essentially invented 
after the 1995 amendments to the Community Reinvestment Act, which put a gun to the head right. of all lenders, banks and non-banks, it said you must, you must make subprime loans, below prime loans at favorable interest terms to low income people, to downright poor people, to Im immigrants, Can to I Latinos, etc. No, I want to finish this point. Sorry. I want to get this out on the table. It's been bugging me for a long time. Jerry Boyer is the only one who got this story right. This meant that, in fact, if these lenders did not make these subprime loans, their business plans would be disrupted. They couldn't acquire. Right. They couldn't merge. They couldn't go into new markets. And it gave inordinate power to local community groups like the Acorn Group to essentially rat out the lender and tell the Fed and the control of the currency that you guys, they're not doing what you want them to do. So guess what? With the era of easy money, that was like pouring gasoline and lighting a match to the Community Reinvestment Act, which set the stage for these unbelievably yeah. stupid Can I please uh, subprime mortgages. Number two, the constant, incessant playing of the race card for votes. Let us say with one voice. The words of James Cleveland's great freedom hymn. I don't feel no ways tired. I come too far from where I started from. Nobody told me that the road would be easy. I don't believe he brought me this far to leave me. Look at what they value and look at their budget and what they're proposing. Romney wants to let the, he said in the first hundred days, he's going to let the big banks once again write their own rules. Unchain Wall Street. They're going to put you all back in chains. This country, though we may not be in El Paso, Texas, is still racist at its foundation, at its core, and throughout this system. <laughs> Are they in some sort of time warp? Did they sleep through the fact that a black man got elected and re-elected president of the United States of America? And the fact that there were 700 counties who voted for Barack Obama in 2008 and 2012, 200 of them switched to Trump in 2016. When were they bitten by the racist radioactive spider? And guess what? The town that most voted for Donald Trump was Abilene, Texas, 80%. According to the 2010 census, it's 75% white. Guess which town just voted for their first black mayor? Abilene, Texas. Orlando Patterson is a Harvard sociologist and a Democrat. Here's what he said almost 30 years ago. America is now the least racist white majority society in the world. Has a better record of legal protection of minorities than any other society, white or black, and offers more opportunities to a greater number of black persons than any other society, including all of Africa." End of quote. And number one, Democrats are the pro-abortion party. Nationally, black women terminate pregnancies at far higher rates than other women as well. In 2014, 36% of all abortions were performed on black women, who are just 13% of the female population. End of quote. Do you know who else agrees that the Democratic Party made a mistake in becoming the pro-abortion party? Former Democratic President Jimmy Carter. I've signed a public letter calling for the Democratic Party at the next convention to espouse my position on abortion, which is to minimize the need, requirement for abortion, and limit it only to women whose life are in danger or who are pregnant as a result of rape or incest. I think if the Democratic Party would adopt that policy, that would be acceptable to a lot of people who are now estranged from our party because of the abortion issue, end of quote. Jimmy Carter said this. I have had a problem with abortion, you know, and this has been a long time problem of mine. I, I, I have a hard time believing that, that, that Jesus, for instance, yeah. would approve abortions. Those are 10 reasons I can think of why blacks ought to rethink their allegiance to the Democratic Party. I have more reasons, but we don't have any more time. I'm Larry Elder, and this has been The Larry Elder Show for Epic Times. I'll see you next time. Ever notice how liberal white people who constantly whine about how racist white people are always exclude themselves? Ladies and gentlemen, behold Michael Moore. 
two thirds of all white guys voted for Trump. That means anytime you see three white guys walking at you down the street toward you, two of them voted for Trump. You need to move over to the other sidewalk because these are not good people yeah. that are walking towards you. You should be afraid of them. I, we, you should be afraid of white Trump voters. Now, who does that sound like? You know, to just be grossly generalistic, you could put half of Trump supporters into what I call the basket of deplorables. <laughs> right? The racist, sexist, homophobic, xenophobic, Islamophobic, you name it. Okay, let's examine who should be afraid of whom. Let's look at black, white, interracial, violent crime. Here are the facts. The Bureau of Justice Statistics released its 2018 survey of criminal victimization. According to the study, there were 593,598 interracial violent victimizations, excluding homicide between blacks and whites last year, including white on black and black on white attacks. Blacks committed 537,204 of these interracial felonies, or 90%, and whites committed 56,394 of them, or less than 10%, end of quote. Now, for young white men, the number one cause of preventable death is accidents, you know, like car accidents. For young black men, the number one cause of preventable death is homicide almost always at the hands of another young black man. In 2018, here's what the CDC said. Homicide was the 16th leading cause of death overall in the United States. The third leading cause of death for children aged one to four. The fourth leading cause of death for children aged five to 14. Young, non-Hispanic black males were disproportionately affected by homicide, which was the leading cause of death among non-Hispanic black males aged 15 to 34 years, end of quote. Now, who said this? There is nothing more painful to me at this stage in my life than to walk down the street and hear footsteps and start thinking about robbery. Then I look around and see someone white and feel relieved. We've got the power right now to stop killing each other. There is a code of silence based upon fear. Our silence is a sanctuary for killers and drug dealers. There must be a market revolt. The victim has to rise up, end of quote. The author of those two statements, Jesse Jackson, you know, the one on the right. Sadly, this Jacksonville, Florida newscast, all too common. The bodies of those three young men who were shot and killed last night are now here at the medical examiner's office awaiting autopsies. We looked at the statistics and we found that young African-American men have a much greater risk of being killed in homicides than men their same age from different races. The crime tape, evidence markers and bullet riddled cars. It is a scene that we have witnessed again and again. Liberal Fox News pundit Juan Williams. And I've been writing this and I feel this deeply in my heart. I wrote a book about this many years ago and took a lot of criticism. I understand that we are at a moment where people are very upset about the police activities. But you're right, it's on a daily basis. The carnage is black on black, typically young black male on young black male. And you don't hear the same outcry. Where is the civil rights movement on this issue? Juan Williams said the number one cause of preventable death for young black men was homicide. He got fact checked last year. PolitiFact found that 93% of murder victims were killed by someone who shares their race. Compared to other ethnicities, the numbers really stand out. 40% of African American males, 15 to 34, who died were murdered, according to the CDC, compared to just 3.8% of white males who died. Overall, 14% of all men, 15 to 34, who died in 2011 were murdered. In 2011, Black males, 15 to 34, were 10 times more likely to die of murder than whites of the same group, end of quote. <laughs> well, 
PolitiFact rated Juan Williams' statement, true. Now what about all homicides? Of all the murder victims for whom race was known, 51.9% were black or African American. 43.5% were white, and 3.0% were of other races. Race was unknown for 243 victims. So, about half the nation's homicide victims were black, even though blacks comprised just 13% of the population, and whites, at 60% of the population, committed about 43% of the homicides. So blacks are overrepresented in the homicide stats, and whites are underrepresented in the homicide stats. Come again, Michael Moore? Two-thirds of all white guys voted for Trump. That means anytime you see three white guys walking at you down the street toward you, two of them voted for Trump. You need to move over to the other sidewalk because these are not good people yeah. that are walking towards you. You should be afraid of them. <laughs> well, Michael Moore tells us we should be fearful of white Trump voters because they're not good people. But Rasmussen asks blacks, whites, and Hispanics of these three groups, which one is, quote, more likely to be racist, close quote. Whites said blacks. Hispanics said blacks. Blacks said blacks. Americans consider blacks more likely to be racist than whites and Hispanics in this country. 37% of American adults think most black Americans are racist, according to a new Rasmussen Report national survey. Just 15% consider most whites racist, while 18% say the same of most Hispanic Americans. Among black Americans, 31% think most blacks are racist, while 24% consider most whites racist, and 15% view most Hispanics that way. End of quote. Now what about hate crime? Let's take a look at the 2017 FBI stats. Hate crime offenders. 50.7% were white versus 60.7% of the population. 21.3% were black versus 13% of the population. Now what's going on here? It's the elephant in the room. Lack of black fathers in the home. But here's the question I have. Where are the dads? When there are no fathers around to raise a young black boy to uh, develop into a healthy human being, what you end up with, when, when that father's not there to shape behavior, you end up with a young man who is unmanageable and he ends up being a misfit that the law enforcement officer has to deal with aggressively, unfortunately. So what we need to do is stop all this nonsense within the black community, take hold of our families, start having more effective parenting, stop with this charade about the police uh, use of force when in fact underclass behavior is at the forefront of a lot of what's going on in the American ghetto. Now Malcolm X says the big enemy of black people are liberals just like Michael Moore who peddle nonsense they talk about how they have the solution, they have the idea, they have the cure. Here's what Malcolm X said about people like Michael Moore. The worst enemy that the Negro have is this white man that runs around here drooling at the mouth, professing to love Negroes and calling himself a liberal. And it is following these white liberals that has perpetuated problems that Negroes have. If the Negro wasn't taken, tricked, or deceived by the white liberal, then Negroes would get together and solve our own problems. I only cite these things to show you that in America, the history of the white liberal has been nothing but a series of trickery designed to make Negroes think that the white liberal was going to solve our problems. Our problems will never be solved by the white man." End of quote. <laughs> Finally, one more thing about our woke friend Michael Moore. He steadfastly insists He's not in the 1%. I, I need you to admit the bleeding obvious. I need you to sit here and say, I'm in the 1%. Because it's important. Well, I can't. Because I'm not. Of your argument. You are, then. Uh, no, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not in the 1%? I'm, of course I'm not. How can I be in the 1%? Because you're worth millions. That's, <laughs> no, that's not true. That, listen, I do really well. I do well. But, but, but what's, the, what's the point, though? Isn't I that... That's because I find it more interesting if you're in the 1%, because I think yeah. you probably are, yeah. you qualify, right. that you are railing against a lot of capitalist ideals. Well, then, if you believe that about me, uh, then that's really something, isn't it? No, I'm it? asking if you that accept even, that. That even, though, 
that even though I do well, that I don't associate myself with those who do well. I am devoting my life to those who, who have less and who've been, who've been crapped upon by this system. Not part of the 1%. I mean, the man has a net worth of $50 million. Unfortunately, Michael Moore got divorced. Unfortunately, it gave us a glimpse into his opulent lifestyle. You know, the non 1% lifestyle. This $2 million home on Torch Lake is owned by filmmaker Michael Moore and his wife of 22 years, Kathleen Glenn. I am disappointed in what appears to me to be a conflict in his values and what he represents. But now the pair just settled a high profile divorce. In court filings, Moore had blamed his wife for going overboard and expanding the 10,000 square foot house, reportedly in the same neighborhood as Madonna and Bruce Willis. Hi, I'm Michael Moore. Ever since his 1989 documentary, Roger and Me. Do you think it's a little dangerous handing out guns in a bank? In other films like Bowling for Columbine and Fahrenheit 9-11, Moore had built a blue-collar, anti-capitalist image. I am one person. Uh, this is a, a movement of millions of voices. Slamming the 1% at this Occupy Wall Street protest. The new court documents reveal Moore and his now ex-wife shared properties in Michigan and New York. The Detroit News reports the couple owned nine total. No comment from her lawyer. And Moore's attorney would only say the couple has mutually and amicably reached a divorce settlement. Nine houses? Nine? Well, in Michael Moore's defense, if a bad guy's out to get him, the bad guy won't know which of the nine houses Michael Moore's hiding out in. An anti-capitalist capitalist can't be too safe, right? <laughs> Stay woke, my friends. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Larry Elder. And this has been the Larry Elder Show for Epic Times. I will see you next time. Michael Moore. Nine houses. Nine! <laughs>
But what they didn't understand is that we were supporting him with our silence. <laughs> because we understood that this nigga was clearly lying. None of these details added up at all. He said he's walking down the street in Chicago and, and, and uh, white dudes come up to him and say, hey man, aren't you that faggot nigger from Empire? Does that sound like how white people talk? I know white people. They don't talk like that. Are you that faggot nigger from Empire? They would never say that. It sounds like something that I would say. If you're a racist and homophobic, you're not even gonna know who this nigga is. You can't watch Empire. <laughs> Black people never feel sorry for the police, but this time we even felt sorry for the police. Can you imagine if you was a police veteran taking this kid's police report? Okay, Mr. Smoulier, please tell me what happened. All right, 2 a.m. You left the house at 2 a.m. It's minus 16 degrees. And... You were walking. You were walking. All right. And, and where were you going? Subway. Sandwiches? That's when the men approach you? Did you see them? Do you have any... Okay, what do they have on? MAGA hats! MAGA hats on in Chicago? Excuse me one second, Mr. Smoot, yeah. Frank, come here for a second. Find out where Kanye West was last night. Michelle Obama recently complained about white flight from her old South Side Chicago neighborhood when she grew up. And she implied it was totally because of anti-black white racism. But unbeknownst to us, we grew up in the period, as I write, of, called white flight. Yeah. That as families like ours, upstanding families like ours, you know, who were doing everything we were supposed to do and better, um, as we moved in, uh, white folks moved out because they were afraid of what our families represented. And I always stop there when I talk about this out, out in the world because, you know, I want to remind white folks that y'all were running, running from us, <laughs> you know, because... This family. This family. Yeah. <laughs> this family, <laughs> with all the values that you read about, yeah. you were running from us, and you're still running. Now, I'm... 12 years older than Michelle Obama, and I witnessed my neighborhood transitioning from white to black as well. We were the second black family on my block in 1959 when my parents moved from Pico Union to South Central. And within a few years, as happened apparently in Michelle Obama's neighborhood, virtually all the whites moved out. Now I gotta tell you something. I went to a high school, Washington High School, where maybe a third to 50% of the students were white. And I was just there one semester, but I saw several instances of black-white altercations, verbal taunting, physical abuse, and near as I could figure out, whenever I could determine who started it, it was a black person. Now, I'm not saying whites didn't start fights. I'm just saying in that one semester when I was there, I saw many instances in which whites were picked on, verbally taunted, verbally abused, pushed around. I never saw it the other way around. Now, you're a white kid, you come home to your parents and you tell them you got beaten up or put down or verbally taunted by black kids. What are your parents gonna do? They're gonna move out. Now, I'm not saying that all of the moving out had to do with that, but to ignore the fact that a lot of times there was friction between blacks and whites and a lot of time the friction was started by a black person is to ignore a much more complicated picture and Michelle Obama is ignoring the reality. Let me give you another example. 
First day high school, Washington High School. I'm eating lunch by myself. There's a white kid not too far from me eating lunch by himself. Three or four black guys come up to him, and one black guy carefully removes a white handkerchief from his pocket, lays it on the rail that the white kid was leaning against, and says, clean my shoe. And the white kid says, excuse me? And the black guy said, I said, shine my shoe. And the white kid said, why should I shine your shoe? I don't even know you. I haven't done anything to you. And the black guy looked at the clock, pointed to it, and said, when that clock strikes one o'clock, the bell's going to go off. If that bell goes off and you haven't shined my shoe, I'm going to kick your you-know-what. Tick, tick, tick. More and more people started gathering around, and the white kid refused to shine his shoe. The bell went off, and the black kid balled his fist up and hit that white kid in the face. Let me tell you something. When somebody gets hit in the face in real life, it doesn't sound like television. It sounded awful. But this white kid knew some form of martial art or something, and he assumed some sort of fighting position and started beating the crap out of this black kid. And then the black kid's friends jumped in, and pretty soon the white kid was fighting off two or three people, and then pretty soon more people jumped in, and pretty soon the white kid started running, and a stream of all black people were following him. Now again, I saw lots of things like that over the course of that semester. Nothing quite that dramatic. Now, how many white kids went home to their mothers and fathers and said, look, I got bullied, I got picked on, I got pushed around, I got hit for no reason? How many times did that happen? And when it did happen, how many parents do you think said, okay, we've got to move? All I'm saying is to ignore this is to ignore a much more complicated picture. I had a very good friend who was a amazing athlete, but he had an attitude. And the coach, white coach, did not know how to deal with him and with the black kids who moved into the neighborhood. Many of them were very disrespectful. In one case, my friend came to practice late. He was the best player on the team. The coach dressed him down verbally, and my friend took off his jersey, threw it in the coach's face, and the coach started him. Now, when all the major colleges came, when Notre Dame came, when UCLA came, when Marquette came to recruit this guy, the coach told the truth about what happened. And my friend did not get recruited at any of the major schools and blamed it on the coach's racism, as opposed to the way he treated that coach. All I'm saying is there were a lot of instances like that when I was growing up, which is why there was also in my neighborhood black flight. A lot of black people moved out or sent their kids to Catholic schools because of the growing violence that was going on in some of these public schools. And this is well before busing. Another thing about white flight, Eric Holder, Obama's AG, complained about what he called pernicious racism. One example he gave was the fact that black boys are suspended and expelled from school disproportionately more compared to their percentage in that given school student body. Jesse Jackson made the same argument back in 1999 when Decatur, Illinois, a school district there, kicked out a bunch of black kids for fighting after a football game. In comes Jesse Jackson, files a lawsuit against the all-white Decatur School Board, and accuses them of racism. The Decatur School Board, however, defended itself by pointing out, irrespective of the race of the school board, irrespective of the race of the teacher, all across America, black boys are disproportionately kicked out or suspended from school. Even in Oakland, where the Oakland School Board was predominantly, quote, people of color, black boys were substantially more likely to be kicked out or suspended than non-black boys. You cannot blame it on racism. Now, if you're a white kid going to a school where there's more violence and black kids are disproportionately kicked out, and you go home and you tell your parents about this, what do you think your parents are gonna do? Back to Michelle Obama. In 2008, when her husband was running for president, they were interviewed by Steve Croft of 60 Minutes. Croft asked her the following. This is a tough question to ask, mm -hmm. but a number of years ago, Colin Powell was thinking about running for president, and his wife, Alma, really did not want him to mm -hmm. run. She was worried about some crazy person with a gun. Mm -hmm. Has that been a factor? I mean, have you talked about that? Is that something that you think about? I don't lose sleep over it um, because the realities are that, you know, as a black man, you know, Barack can get shot going to the gas station. So she's admitting that her neighborhood is dangerous. Again, does that at all contribute to what she complained about? White flight? Now let's talk about education. Michelle Obama says that she went to a public school, and that's true. However, she did not go to the local public school. 
She was on a bus three hours a day to go to what essentially was a mm -hmm. Chicago magnet school in order to avoid the inferior local school. Does that at all contribute to white flight, the quality of education, the quality of local schools? I saw the same thing when I was growing up. There were families in my neighborhood that put their kids in Catholic schools because they thought the academic curve was better and because they thought there was less violence. Does something like that contribute to white flight? Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez inadvertently also made the case for white flight when she talked about what her family did in order for her to avoid going to an inferior local government school. Dad looked at the quality of education in the Bronx and they looked at 50% dropout rates. They looked at the inequity of education, the inequity of education funding, the fact that teachers weren't paid, the fact that kids weren't given their, their tools to succeed, and that, frankly, it not only had to do with their income, but it had to do with their melanin, too. Yeah. And so they made, and my family made a really hard decision. And my whole family chipped in to buy a small house about 40 minutes north of here. And that's when I got my first taste of a country who allows their kids' destiny to be determined by the zip code that they are born in. Now let's take a look at another factor, interracial, violent, black, white crime. Here's what the Manhattan Institute's Heather McDonald says. Just this month, the Bureau of Justice Statistics released its 2018 survey of criminal victimization. According to the study, there were 593,000 598 interracial violent victimizations, excluding homicide, between blacks and whites last year, including white on black and black on white attacks. Blacks committed 537,204 of those interracial felonies, or 90%. Whites committed 56,394 of them, or less than 10%. End of quote. Finally, Michelle Obama says about whites, you're still running. And you're still running. Then why did Reverend Al Sharpton tee off on whites from moving into Harlem, calling them interlopers? And why did Spike Lee do this epic rant against white people moving into certain areas of New York? Check this out. Um, gentrification. You mentioned gentrification in, with some slightly negative connotations. And I, I wondered if you would ever looked at it from the other side which is that if your family was still in that $40,000 home, it's now worth three and a half or four million dollars. All right, let me, let me, let, let, me, me, let, me, let me just kill you right now. Okay, <laughs> go for it. Let because me. there was a bull article in the New York Times saying the good of gentrification. I don't believe that. That's, here's the thing. I grew up here in Fort Greene. I grew up here in New York. It's changed. And why does it take the influx of white New Yorkers in the South Bronx, in Harlem, in Bed-Stuy, in Crown Heights for the facilities to get better? The garbage wasn't picked up every month of the day. What I, what I did is one, 180 wash, 165 Washington Park. PS20 was not good. PS11. Wolf Child, 294. So why, 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 the police went around. When you see white mothers push their babies in strollers three o'clock in the morning down 125th Street, that must tell you something. And, and I don't dispute that. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> and even more. Let me kill you some more. I'm coming back. <laughs> can, can I talk about that? No, not yet. Not yet. yet. <laughs> and then the mother Christopher Columbus syndrome. You can't discover this. We've been here. You just can't come in both bars. But, but, but. And you're still running. So which is it? Whites are racist because they left neighborhoods that became all black? Or whites are racist because they're moving into mostly all black neighborhoods? And by the way, when it comes to discrimination, nobody has clean hands. Check out this 1999 article from the Los Angeles Times. Despite being one of the most diverse metropolitan areas in the world, 
greater Los Angeles remains a hotbed of racial and ethnic housing discrimination. Two recent studies of rental practices found that Latino landlords are discriminating against African Americans and black landlords are discriminating against Latinos at levels comparable to those practiced by whites against minority groups a decade ago. End of quote. Moral to the story, no group has a monopoly on hate and on fear. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. So, when it comes to white flight and black flight, the picture is a little more complicated than the one Michelle Obama painted for us. I'm Larry Elder, and this has been The Larry Elder Show for Epic Times. I'll see you next time. About President Trump's decision to authorize a drone strike to take out the top Iranian general, Qasem Soleimani, here's what the New York Times said. General Soleimani did not have to be hunted. A high-ranking official of the Iranian government, he was in plain sight for years. All that was required was a president to decide to pull the trigger. Presidents George W. Bush and Barack Obama never did. Mr. Bush's administration made a conscious decision not to kill General Soleimani when he was in the crosshairs. And Mr. Obama's administration evidently never made an effort to pursue him. Both reasoned that killing the most powerful general in Iran would only risk a wider war with the country. So both presidents Bush and Obama did a cost-benefit analysis and decided taking out Soleimani was not worth the risk. That ain't what Obama's former United Nations ambassador and national security advisor Susan Rice said. There's been a bunch of reporting um, over a period of years um, that the U.S. had previously assessed that it could be more dangerous to kill Qasem Soleimani, the head of the Quds Force in Iran, uh, than to allow him to live, even when U.S. forces did potentially have a shot at him. I just wanted to ask, there's a lot of discussion about that reporting now that this airstrike has happened and that Soleimani is dead. What's your, what can you tell us in a non-classified setting here about that reporting, whether it's accurate, and, and is there any reason that we should think that that calculation somehow changed before this airstrike? Well, to my knowledge, Rachel, uh, and certainly while I was national security advisor, the Obama administration was not presented with an opportunity by our intelligence community or by the U.S. military uh, to strike Qasem Soleimani. Um, had we been presented with such an opportunity, what we would have done is weighed very carefully and very deliberately the risks versus the potential rewards. Now, did she say that neither the intelligence community nor the military presented Obama with an opportunity to kill Soleimani? Yes, she did. The Obama administration was not presented with an opportunity by our intelligence community or by the U.S. military uh, to strike Qasem Soleimani. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what she said. Now, the next line of attack against Trump is that Soleimani did not present an imminent threat, as the president said. You put out a statement a short time ago that says the decision to eliminate General Soleimani was in response to imminent threats to American lives. What was the nature of those imminent threats? John, I can't too, talk too much about the nature of the threats, but the American people should know that President Trump's decision to remove Qasem Soleimani from the battlefield saved American lives. There's no doubt about that. They were aiming to take down uh, significant amounts of Americans that would have undoubtedly killed uh, locals too, Iraqis, Lebanese, Syrians perhaps, people all throughout the region. Uh, this was an attack that would have been at some scale. Uh, we can't talk much about the details, but suffice it to say the American people can know that uh, the decision that President Trump made to take Qasem Soleimani down saved American lives. He was President Trump is speaking now. Let's listen executed a flawless precision strike that killed the number one terrorist anywhere in the world, Qasem Soleimani. Soleimani was plotting imminent and sinister attacks on American diplomats and military personnel, but we caught him in the act and terminated him. Imminent threat? The man had the blood of over 600 Americans on his hands, he was a walking, talking imminent threat. I thought we were at war. Now, 
the Democratic rivals all agreed that Soleimani was a bad guy, but... Let's be clear. Soleimani, General Soleimani, was the architect of, uh, behind the slaughter of countless lives in the region. The deaths of U.S. troops are on his hands, and no American mourns his passing. He deserves to be brought to justice. He deserved to be brought to justice for his crimes. But no matter how rightly reviled he was in the West, he was a senior figure of the Iranian government. And there's no doubt that Iran will, in fact, respond. Indeed, they've already vowed vengeance. But we never should have been in this position to begin with. Uh, this assassination of General Soleimani uh, is reckless, and it has been part of an escalating series of attacks that the Trump administration has put forward. And it has put our troops at risk. It has put our diplomats at risk. And they're already changing their story about the whole thing. But... One issue that I know is on everybody's mind, and that is that last night, as you know, a U.S. airstrike killed Iran's most notorious military commander, a murderer with the blood of Americans on his hands. And uh, with, uh, without more information, I can only hope that the president has carefully thought out the national security implications of this attack on our country and the grave risks that it involves. Uh, but given his track record and his history of making reckless decisions and impulsive decisions uh, that undermine U.S. strategic objectives and weaken our allies, particularly recently in Syria, uh, there is every reason, I think, to be deeply concerned. But uh, hopefully he's done the right thing and we'll see what happens. Now, Democrats in the media do not trust Donald Trump and, of course, expressed a great deal of skepticism. There is absolutely no reason for anyone in the U.S. to credit anything the president or his administration says about matters of life and death and war and peace until it is demonstratively verified. Full stop. I think it's time to back up a tad. Who exactly was Qasem Soleimani and why was it important for him to be killed? Iran is waging a campaign here for control of Iraq and also for its influence in the wider Middle East. And at the heart of that campaign, in the shadows, has been one man. General Qasem Soleimani, head of the Quds Force, the covert external wing of Iran's Revolutionary Guards. In Tehran, he has the ear of Ayatollah Khamenei himself. But in Iraq, he's been cited taking personal command of Shia militia groups. Soldiers and politicians blanch at the very mention of his name. Now, after Soleimani was killed, former Trump ambassador Nikki Haley tweeted this. Qasem Soleimani was an arch terrorist with American blood on his hands. His demise should be applauded by all who seek peace and justice. Proud of President Trump for doing the strong and right thing. End of quote. And back in September 2018, the then UN ambassador Haley issued a warning to Soleimani and to Iran. Iranian general and head of the IRGC Quds Force, Soleimani, is leading an effort to influence the composition of a new Iraqi government. I remind my colleagues that Soleimani was banned from traveling outside of Iran by the Security Council in 2007. That ban was reaffirmed in 2015 with the passage of Security Council Resolution 2231. Despite this unambiguous travel ban, Soleimani has practically taken up residence in Iraq since the May elections. This fact was noted by the Secretary General in the most recent 2231 implementation report. And let's be clear what Soleimani is up to in Iraq. He is not there to help create a government in Baghdad that is responsive to the Iraqi people. He is there to build an Iraqi government that is under the control of the Iranian regime. Again, Soleimani was a walking, talking, imminent threat, 24-7, 365 days out of the year. Now, back in 1996, when the Iran Revolutionary Guard orchestrated a bombing attack, Joe Biden said this. 
Do you believe that Iran is behind this? Well, I, I, I don't know, but the fact is, they it looks like there's. If they are. It looks like there's. So you want to know like what they, they do? May it's an act of war. I'll give you the last word. Sure. And they okay. yield their sovereignty if they do. Wiretaps won't change that. An, an act of war. It's an act of war. And so the United States does what? It could take whatever action it deems appropriate. Now, what would a president, Joe Biden, call the recent rocket attack that killed an American contractor? Now, a U.S. contractor has been killed in an attack on an Iraqi military base. Several rockets were fired into the base near Kirkuk that houses both Iraqi and U.S. troops. Several service personnel were also injured. Simona Fultin has more from Baghdad on that attack. Well, this attack occurred last night. It was several rockets that hit inside uh, the K-1 military base, which houses both U.S. forces as well as Iraqi forces. And this base is used to launch important operations against, against ISIL, uh, who have staged an insurgency in the surrounding mountains. Now, this is just the latest in a spate of similar rocket attacks, but it's the first time that we're actually seeing uh, U.S. casualties. Iran was warned. We will not stand for the Islamic Republic of Iran to take actions that put American men and women in jeopardy. Critics are saying that Soleimani posed no imminent threat. Well, by that definition, neither did Osama bin Laden, who was cowering in a hideout, or Saddam Hussein, who was cowering in a spider hole. They were no longer on the battlefield, unlike Qasim Soleimani. As for those criticizing President Trump for pulling from the Iran deal, I have a question. Isn't there something fundamentally corrupt about a deal which, if one side unilaterally pulls out like we did, the other side kills you? Think about it. Finally, I'm getting a lot of good feedback about our Epic Times videos, and I appreciate it. I got a phone call, however, from this young lady who felt I wasn't working hard enough. <laughs> Check it out. Hi, Larry. I am so upset, and I have so, such a big complaint about you. You're not on the radio Saturday and Sunday, and I don't know what the hell to do with myself. I am so upset. You also take breaks. Breaks, uh, five minutes is too much of a break. I don't think you should have any breaks. <sighs> okay. All right. I hope things will change. I hope to hear you more often on the radio. God bless you. Happy, healthy New Year to you. And keep your <laughs> together. <laughs> so, I should work Saturdays and Sundays and not take any breaks? What, put a bedpan next to my studio? <laughs> Please. The 13th Amendment abolished slavery. <laughs> I'm Larry Elder, and this has been The Larry Elder Show for Epic Times. I'll see you next time.